Well, it's still plus politics. Let's move on to our next issue. Edward Callan, the United Nations Humanitarian Coordinator in Nigeria, has stated that about 1.2 million civilians are currently trapped in Boko Haram-controlled territories and have been denied access to human humanitarian aid and services. Now, he stated also that humanitarian workers have, in the past 18 months, become major targets of these insurgents. If this is true, what is the government doing about it? <laughs> this question is very interesting. <laughs> what is the government doing about anything? <laughs> but one of the reasons why those Nigerians who protested in the UK yesterday protested is because the level of insecurity, whether we like it or not, is on the rise. It might not be making the pages of the national dailies because the presidency seems to be taking up all the space on the covers of our national dailies. Now, if we have about 1 point something million people still trapped in insurgent enclaves, and we say Boko Haram has been defeated, they've been pushed into, you know, the edges towards Cameroon, are we being fair and realistic or we're just, you know, putting a, a plaster on the cancer? The question is, each time we hear Boko Haram as occupied, Boko Haram has been defeated. Boko Haram does not have uh, any territory under, on, on, under, the, under the sovereignty of Nigeria. This is purely insecurity. Because one of the fundamentals of being in government is that the security of life of every Nigerian. The word every on, in the constitution is stated, every Nigerian. So if one Nigeria is insecure, then it means that in Niger Nigeria is insecure. So having them in Boko Haram camp or concentrate uh, in a concentrated place where Boko Haram now terrifies them is worse of us because we've been hearing this story year in year out since the, uh, under the Jonathan administration you know, since the last two administrations that we've had and the question is what does it take to win and ensure that we secure our sovereignty our state and each time you buy if you if you check the amount of budget that goes in, into security for North East Nostis is enjoying three level of budget from my own small findings, from the national budget, from the international funding, and from the, uh, aid, uh, from the international humanitarian aid. And the humanitarian aid now are now saying to Nigerians that even with all our resources to help these people, they are still under cap captivity of Boko Haram. And we cannot even reach them with the budget of aid that we have meant to give to them, to liberate them, to make them come alive and become normal human beings to function properly. So the question to government is, what does it take to secure every inch of Nigeria to ensure that we are not in, in any form, in any ramification under the influence or the, uh, or under the foreign, um, sorry, under the terrorist camp being concentrated and controlling? It means that a portion of this 774 local government, two of it. So right now, Nigeria has only 772 local government. Two is under Boko Haram. Should that be so? No. So government should give us a major reason why this is happening from the chief of staff and every other paraphernalia of security that is in this country. Because the question is, we must be seeing that no part of Nigeria is ceded out to Boko Haram or any form of terrorist group in the country. Now, Mr. Callan, um, who is of the United Nations Humanitarian uh, Coordination Department, has also talked about trust with, between the army, the people, and the government. He's saying there is no synergy of sorts. He's, he's saying it's very important that there be a renewed commitment. So it looks like um, the commitment has waned so far. I mean, under the Jonathan administration, Boko Haram was a headline. Mm. And it came from the opposition half the time. They, so maybe the opposition under this administration is not playing its role. And the Boko Haram squad is still very much alive. Yeah, I think the, there's, there's a major trust deficit. That's for sure. Um, and part of it, well, most of it, to be honest, I'll blame the government. I'm not one to put everything on the government all the time. But for that, I blame them. And the reason for that is... When they come out and say things like Boko Haram has been technically defeated, 
Nobody's list, nobody hears technically. All people are hearing is Boko Haram has been defeated. And so in people's minds, you, you hear about a bomb attack here, troops attacked there, and now we're hearing they control two local government um, areas in Nigeria. And in people's minds, it's like, wait, but you said these people have been defeated. And then the, the government now comes up with all sorts of explanations about the meaning of technically defeated. And all that's just nonsense because people are losing their lives. And I, I think I saw a statistic today. We've lost about close to 40,000 people, about 30-something thousand no, in, the ten, in the last 10 years. Well, we've 35,000 people. 35, in the last 10 years. Of that number, more than half are military personnel, which is, which is, is heartbreaking because mm -hmm. these people have families, for God's mm -hmm. sake. And they're not, we're not talking about a war against another country. This is one within our own country, for crying out loud. And so when I, when I see these kinds of statistics and then I hear things like, well, Boko Haram has been defeated. They're only attacking soft targets. They're, I feel like saying, you know, just be, it's better you don't even say anything because when you make these kinds of statements, the only thing you're, in, you're, you're putting hope in people that, yes, this is what the case is. But every single time something else happens, you're chipping away at that hope that you've given them already, which is worse than if they didn't even have any hope at all in the first place. And that's where the problem is. Because, you, I mean, I, I, I understand that at its peak, Boko Haram, I think, controlled about 11 or 12 local governments. Mm -hmm. And um, with it, with, I think with a territory the size of Belgium or so at, the, at, at its peak. And right now it's two. So from that perspective, they would say, well, we've made progress. Yes, there has been. Nobody's saying there hasn't been progress. But stop saying things like Boko Haram has been defeated. The, the reality is they've not been defeated. They're still coming back and they're still killing people. Troops are still dying. Civilians are still dying. Um, innocent people are still being kidnapped. It's, it's still happening. So they really need to stop this narrative of we've defeated them. If, they're, if what they're trying to do is maybe, I don't know if it's a political, um, if it's a political maneuver or, or to stop the opposition. PL's yeah, stopped. to stop the opposition from doing what they did with John. And I liked what, the, don't get me wrong, I was, not, not say I liked, but I appreciated what they did under the last administration because they were able to keep this thing front and center, which is where it should be. Because for something this serious, you can't sweep it under the carpet because people are dying in the country. That's the reality. But right now, the table, the, the, the shoe is on the other foot. So you can't now t start telling us that um, it's been defeated. And then every time somebody raises something, you say, no, it's soft target. It's human life. I That's mean, those targets at the end of the day are human lives. But let me just put out some <laughs> statistics. Now, Mr. Callan also noted that Boko Haram, uh, the insurgency is going to clock its 10th year. Yes. Uh, and not less than 7 million people are still in need of humanitarian assistance. Let's not forget, for every budget cycle we have, monies are being um, set aside for these IDP camps. Mm. And the food, the water finds a way out of those camps. It never really gets to the people. So that's why we, ha we have these humanitarian issues. He also said that over the past 10 years, 35,000 people have lost their lives in the crisis, about 14,000 of them civilians. Others were members of the armed force. He lamented that the Boko Haram insurgency has also led to the deaths of many humanitarian workers. So it's not just those who live in those areas, even those who are trying to render help are suffering. And we had, I remember so vividly how we had issues of disparity in figures. The army would say this, the government would say something different. It's just, again, I'd say it's a trust issue. So, so if the government really wants to win the war against this insurgency, should they not be doing, making sure that they cover all grounds instead of just trying to cover their end of the trail? Sorry, I think it's... What I'm saying is, should the government not be doing everything within its power? Because it looks more like, like he said, they're just trying to cover their trail and say, OK, we're doing great. Uh, the army is handling everything. We're good. I remember the video last, last year or the year before where uh, soldiers, last year, soldiers came out saying we don't have enough weaponry to fight against Boko Haram because what they have is 10 times better than what we have. If you look at Boko Haram, Boko Haram 
aim and, and uh, aspiration is to conquer. To conquer and bring as much territory under their control. Well, they lost, they've lost so many so well. So, and for Nigerian government, our aim is to ensure that Boko Haram or any form of ter uh, uh, terrorists do not occupy even an inch of our sovereignty. So you can see the ambition, uh, sorry, the desire and our own objective. So, and which one sh should we focus on? Our objective is not even an inch of any sovereignty, of any part of our so so sovereignty should be under the siege of a terrorist. So for, for Nigerian government, we need to, def because Boko Haram will go back and, you know, re reinforce. Re reinforce very well. We need to, there was something they did some time ago. You have identified them from the map the two local government mm -hmm. in question. How are they getting into the, those local government? Is that local government on the borderline of Nigeria? Why don't you get the international force to cover the, the other end of the border and go in with your full force to flush them out? Because for us to hear that Boko Haram is occupying two local government, it means that we know where the challenge is. And all we need to do is to go into that local government as a matter of urgency and ensure that we, you know, join for us. With Apart the from the warfare, the other... I'm going to take my question again. Aside from warfare, which we know that the army is, you know, <coughs> all hands are on deck, hopefully. What about those people who have been hit by this insurgency? We're talking about people who have lost their homes, people who have lost family members, people who are still sick, who were hit, or, you know, victims of these insurgents. They seem to be abandoned, and this is the issue here. Ten years down the line, they still cannot recover or go back to where they used to call home. It seems that the government is overtaken by fighting the war, and then they forget about the people who were victims of this the insurgency. Is the war keeps coming back. The war is not over yet. So should the people be abandoned at the, the expense people, of the this warfare? Not be abandoned. That's why they are in a concentration camp called IDP. And that's why it's not a concentration camp it, it's a concentration camp is a bad place it it's it, it, it's get there and see how they live get there and see how much yeah sorry sorry for each other word for that mm -hmm. for, for that but if you get it because that's just trying to describe how worse we should not get that we should get better get more aid in there get more water get more food to the people you know people should begin to willingly leave those camps when they see their life has returned to normalcy, their villages are not under any terrorist uh, uh, authority and all those things. Because the question is, some of those people you are told to leave, we're talking about poverty, for instance. Their community has been ravaged. Mm -hmm. Has government rebuilt their houses? Have they reconstructed their roads in their cities, uh, in their uh, local areas? Are there water for them? And so those are the two questions. So when you see where you have some level of provisions and you're going to an unknown where there are no provisions, there are no infrastructures, so which one would you choose? So that's a big question. Well, it, it seems like the people are in between the, the devil and the deep blue sea, but I want to thank you guys. It's, it's like we're ending all our conversations on a sad note because we are like at a deadlock. We don't know exactly where we go from here. Thank you, Lulu Ligbe and uh, Rahman Adebi, our political analyst, and it's been fun having this conversation. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. You well, we'll take a short break uh, and bring you our plus package when we return. I'll give you my take. The Independent National Electoral Commission has said that sensitive materials for the November 16 governorship election in Bayelsa State are ready for delivery. The commission said the normal process of inspection and distribution within the state will be done in the presence of party agents, security agencies, observers and the media. The chairman of INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, noted that INEC had delivered all non-sensitive materials to his Bayelsa State office in Yenegua long ago. We have repeatedly warned all staff of the commission to remain neutral and professional. All election duty staff will swear to an oath of neutrality as required by law. Training of ad hoc staff has been intense. Materials and staff will be deployed promptly to all PUs. In fact, all non-sensitive materials for the four elections have already been delivered to the states, all and we have patched them and categorized them by local governments and by areas. We are just waiting for the sensitive materials so they will move to the polling units 
as we have promised to do so. The Commission once again appeals to political parties to speak to your candidates and supporters and to advise them against hate speech, inciting statements, fiscal attacks on opponents, destruction of each other's campaign materials, and other sundry violations of the Electoral Act. Of course, voter harassment, voter intimidation, including vote buying at polling units, constitute violations of the Electoral Act. Prohibition of the use of mobile phones by voters in the voting cubicles is still in force. We are going to deepen our collaboration with the EFCC and the ICPC in this respect. They will keep eyes on movement of cash during electioneering campaigns and on election day. So, most importantly, Nigerians have become victims, whether we like it or not. There have been millions of people who survived the scourge of Boko Haram. There are people who still are in captivity of Boko Haram. But a million plus people are still under Boko Haram's siege in Nigeria. The ones who survived, the ones who are in IDP camps, the ones who may not be in IDP camps, who somewhat have returned to where they used to call home, who have un been unable to settle, to get access to good roads and water and get their life together. These people have been abandoned by our government. We may not understand this because we don't live in those areas where Boko Haram has hit. But because you're okay in your house and you have a roof over your head and you can go to work and you can afford to eat Let's say gala and drink coke. What about the people who are unable to have a meal a day? I heard, and I want to say this, a friend of mine who works in one of those IDP camps told me a story about a group of persons who came with food items for children and women in IDP camps. And they were so excited. But guess what? They took pictures, they had photo ops, and right after that, they went back with the, the food stuff. This is the Nigeria that we want. This is the Nigeria that we're living in. Even our government seems to have abandoned the people. The United Nations humanitarian coordinator is saying there is no synergy, there is no trust between all parties. Where does this leave Nigerians who are victims of terrorism? And moving away from that, Nigerians were protesting in the UK, asking Mr. President to come home because you can't be seeking medical treatment abroad when you promised us a better health care and have not delivered on your promises. These persons seem not to have any powers any longer. Do we ask ourselves why these politicians no longer have regards for us? Are they leading us or are they just there for their own selfish intentions? Nigerians need to get smart. We need to get wise and we need to start asking the right questions and making sure that these politicians are answerable to us and not themselves. I'm Mary Anacom. It's been Plus Politics.